just uh, hard to believe that 2021 is uh, already five weeks old. Missions on Sunday is today, and uh, we have uh, lined up for you this year on uh, four different occasions, um, different missionaries that are going to come in and speak on missions on Sundays, and, and uh, we have decided to bring out the best first, and that's our very own uh, missions pastor, and it'll be good for you to hear what he has to say today about missions. Uh, in light of that, I want to just kind of interject something really quick uh, about what's going on in your Bible Institute that all of you have an opportunity to partake in. And that's that sometimes, uh, and, and you say, how does this fit? Well, it'll be very easy to see here in a moment. Some of you saw an email on Friday. Maybe some of you have signed up for some of the classes. I know that some of the big classes that hit everybody are, uh, of course, uh, Revelation or, or the Book of Romans or something like that. Well, this semester are some really neat classes as well. And some might say, well, they're not the highlights. They're not the ones that I'm looking for. Well, let me just show you the three that really show you and reflect for our institute, which is so important upon your, your pastor's heart, upon this church's heart, and upon the staff and, and who we are as a church. But uh, a week from this Sunday, this evening, so that'll be, of course, on Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know if you'll be able to handle that or not. But in that evening, we will start our first class, which will be on manuscript evidence, of course. And Dr. Bobby Bonner, who was a missionary on the field for years, uh, remains traveling as a missionary and preaching at different places. He'll be teaching manuscript evidence and Bible history. Now, all of you that have a Bible on your laps, do you know where it came from? Do you know how it got there? Do you know everything about it? Well, this is a really tremendous course. And here's a man who's been a missionary for a lot of years, that's going to be teaching through that. Of course, the following night, which would be a study on leadership principles and the book of Nehemiah, could there be any great, greater leader than Nehemiah and to learn principles from him? Well, George Grace, who is partnering with our institute, uh, George has been a pastor, of course, for over 40 years and now running the Bible Institute in Rochester, New York, your first Bible up there partnering with us. He'll be doing that course. In fact, he starts it tonight at his institute and then records that, and we'll be using that on Monday night starting a week from tomorrow. And then, just to kind of pull it all together, on Tuesday evenings, starting a week from this Tuesday, Pastor Brian Calloway will be teaching on missions. Now, let me ask you who you would regard to be in a better place to teach such a course. And of course, we went to a lot of expense to fly him in for this course, and he's coming in every single week to teach, and he has to fly back to Zambia every week, and it's really hard, but we've gone to that expense. It's gonna cost us like 40 grand to have him here teaching that course. No, I'm just kidding, he's here, okay, okay. Some of you might go, oh, well, is he really here? Yeah, Brian's here, and Brian and Tammy, of course, are here, and, and so Brian, I asked him last fall, would he consider into the winter time to be teaching this coming spring, and he said he'd love to. So the theology and concepts and principles, the ethics and everything having to do with missions, since he is currently a missionary that we have supported for four years, been to the field. Church, would you please just take advantage of the opportunity to learn the Bible and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior? So many people tell me all these things that they want to do and grow in the Lord, but then there's many things presented, and then it's up to you to choose. If you choose not to, that's okay. I've, I've never had a problem with that. It just means that you're going to miss out on a lot of God's blessings. So tying this together to our missions on Sunday today, our missions pastor um, I believe it's the right thing. In fact, God has led us to have him uh, teach and preach this morning. He's going to be speaking a lot about a report of all the things in 2020, keep you up to date, or get you up to date on all the missionaries that we support and all the work that's going on. So, church, I'd like to have you just really take an ear, an extra special year this morning to, to really listen to what you're part of. This church gives... $11,000 plus every month to missions. Now just do a little bit of mathematics. That's an awful lot of money. For all of you that are good at math, 
That's over $132,000 a year. And that is including supporting the Callaways and supporting other missionaries. It's good to hear what God has done in our lives and no better person to do it than our missions pastor, Pastor Randy, come and preach to us and come and teach to us, please, please. Well, good morning, church. Good to be with you this morning. Um, I am not Dr. Charles Keene. That was supposed to be our first one, okay? And I'm looking forward to uh, when we do have him in May, uh, Lord willing, because I met him, I went with Bobby to an I Am meeting years ago, and that was where I first met Dr. Charles Keene. And so I'm looking really forward to that when we have him in May. Um, but what I would like to do this morning, Pastor asked me a couple of weeks ago to kind of give you a, a recap of 2020 and uh, what happened with all of our different missionaries literally around the, around the globe. And I counted this week um, just to see how many missionaries do we actually physically support. And we support, including Brian and Tammy, um, we support 30 missionaries literally around the globe. And you can see names over here on the signs and everything of the different missionaries that we do support. And, you know, like I told the first, the first crowd, a lot of churches may support a missionary at $25 a month or something like that. And your mission support team, which is, a, a, is made up of about eight different individuals in this church that have been on mission trips and, and have a heart for missions as well, um, we prayerfully consider all of those different people. And when we have new people come on and all that sort of thing, and we we take, it, it's a sacrifice for this church, okay, at times, but we support every missionary. We start them at at least 200 a month, okay, and so that, that really is a shot in the arm uh, to, to those missionaries, um, and so, you know, we have communication with them. So basically what we're going to be doing today is a recap of 2020 and some of our missionaries, okay, and I didn't, I did not hear from all of them. Let me see if my clicker's working. Hey, it is, good. First one that we have are Brian and Mindy Clark in London. And Brian said, 2020 has been a challenging year for Crossroads Baptist Church there in London and for London as a whole. They've been on lockdown for most of the year with a few moments of brief relief, okay? You're going to hear this, this consistently this morning as I talk. Everything, you guys have been through it, you know, okay? We started out last year, 2020, normal. And then March hit and coronavirus, and I remember the first time I heard coronavirus, I was like, what is coronavirus? I mean, it sounds like a beer. I mean, you know, I don't know, but um, not that I've had it, okay? But I mean, it just, it's just what it sounds like, okay? And so I was just really curious what this is, and as everybody did, and obviously we all got a lot more familiar with corona and COVID and all that, okay? So... You'll hear that consistent theme, okay? He said, however, there have been some things that have risen out of this that have been tremendous blessings. And the first thing that he talks about is the gospel course, okay? And this is a new resource that Brian wrote to assist their church and anyone, because it is out online. You can go to Amazon, uh, to your favorite Kindle reader or whatever, and you can pull that down if you'd like to read that. And it's basically, it's a tremendous help, especially considering um, the restriction from sharing the gospel on the street. It's, it teaches and helps people to be able to share the gospel. Another thing that came out of, out of 2020 was Faye Lovelock, okay? And this is a young mother that came to Christ over Zoom, okay, using the gospel course that Brian wrote. Now, the interesting thing is she is the sister of Paul Waller, okay? Anybody in here went to London either in we went in 2015 and 2019. I know my wife went the first year. But anyway, um, Paul Waller is the gentleman that Brian is actually training to take over that church there in London, and Brian will be starting something else. So this is actually his sister. Um, and so this was a huge triumph, and they're hopeful that her husband, Hugo, uh, will be saved as well. Another great uh, thing that happened this year was a new building. They've been praying for a place that they can worship and use for their own for several years now. Right now, they just meet the where they had been meeting on Sunday at, I think church started at like 5 o'clock on Sunday, and, and they would meet, and they had a couple of hours in this little facility, and that was it. Well, now they'll have this, this building that they can use throughout the week, 
and it will just be a great um, blessing to them. Another um, of this year was uh, Marcus Victor. Marcus was a man that they met on the high street. Now, for those of you that have been to London, you know what the high street is. But essentially what the high street is, is it's kind of like the plaza here in Kansas City, okay, except for it's all foot traffic, no, no vehicles or anything. It's just all foot traffic. And he'll have a team come in every week in the month of June. And we've been, again, 2015 and 19. And they'll take a week and they'll go out into the high street every day. And you just stand out there and you try to make contact with people as they're passing you um, and try to share the gospel with them. And it, I tell you, anybody that's been to London, you just ask them. It is a tough tough thing to do, okay? It is very, very hard because they are not receptive to the gospel, and you'll run into every religion and everything out there on the streets of London. Well, Marcus Victor was a guy that got saved on the high street, okay? And, and he has now finished, in the month of June, he finished discipleship with Paul Waller. So this was a huge blessing to them. I mean, when they have one guy get saved and go through discipleship, that is just a huge, huge thing for them. So that was, was really, truly a blessing. The other things that have come out of this year, the YouTube channel, okay? I, I told the first group, and, and uh, Ben laughed when I said this, okay? But if you want to see, um, if you want to catch some great preaching and stuff, Brian Clark, you can do a search on YouTube for Brian Clark Ninja. If you know Brian, you understand, okay? He's a different breed, okay, but um, Brian Clark Ninja, you can go out and listen, but it has been a great thing for them. They've, they've reached so many people beyond London that they wouldn't have reached before. Another thing that he has that's brand new is a second resource called Brand New, okay, and it's a follow-up to the, to the gospel course, so that's going to be available later this year. He says, all in all, it's been a good year, though it has provided several obstacles. God has been good, we look forward to what awaits in 2021. And as so many missionaries do, because this church stays in contact, your, your church here stays in contact, he says, thank you so much for your prayers and your support. Because we do reach out to them um, every month to see what, what prayer requests they might have. Next couple, Brian and Amanda Collins in Keatway, Zambia, which is actually just about an hour and a half from where Brian and Tammy were at at Kafula Futa. Uh, some of you that have been to Africa may have been there. We don't usually go to Kitwe, but occasionally they have to go in there for it's a bigger city, and so they have bigger uh, grocery stores and that sort of thing. Brian and Amanda were actually in the States in 20, uh, most of 20, on furlough. They took it a little bit early once corona hit. And so we tried to, uh, to get together with them. Um, we had planned to have them in in the fall when we had our missionaries on Wednesdays and back in the fall and Brian got Corona so they could, or Corona, sorry, he got COVID. I, I, why do they call it Corona and COVID? I'll never know, but that's okay. Um, so he got COVID, couldn't come and then they had a death in the family, couldn't come. So we didn't get to get together with them, but, but, um, he did send a report, okay? So it says for, as for 2020, we were excited to see the Christian school grow in the first quarter and the beginnings of the Bible college, God was doing great things in both areas. And then, of course, COVID hit, and it shut down these two for the rest of 2020. They came back to the States for furlough during this time, and Zambia was closed. If you heard Brian or just different reports, Zambia did just completely close. And the bad part with that is they're landlocked. And so it really, a country that was already struggling really struggled a lot, okay? And so a lot of the the people really went hungry. I heard Brian say one time uh, that, a, that an African, a Zambian, said they would rather go ahead and get COVID because they would rather die of that than die of starvation because that was literally what was happening in a lot of places as they were dying of starvation. Um, they were finally able to, um, to do some things in December. They had a great youth conference and then they actually flew back to Zambia in this month, 20, uh, January of 2021. He's asking that we pray that the, uh, the school and the Bible college can reopen soon. Uh, Dan and Jan Jellowick, a lot of you, they haven't been to our church. In, well, yeah, they were. I'm sorry, they were here a couple of years ago. But a lot of you, I know, have been to Zambia. If you went in 2017, 
uh, they came down to Kafula Futa for the Bible conference and everything, and so a lot of you have probably uh, met them. Um, Dan, Dan talked about um, in and around Chapada, Zambia, most ministries continued to grow even during all the shutdown. He said they were able to build a brick church structure for Chikoka Bible Baptist Church with the help of many friends and supporters. And I got verification in between services that yes, this church did actually put on the, the roof of that structure right there. So again, your, your tithes, your special offerings, all those kind of things, they go. Mark often will, will, t will tell you that if you specify something on your, on your offering envelope, 100% of it will go, and that's the kind of thing that it does go to. So just so you, I, I like for you guys to know things happen, okay? And so that's, that's one of the things right there. Um, one of the churches there, the church that, that Kevin Pesky started years ago uh, in Chapada was called Big Tree. And the reason was because they met under a big tree, okay? And so they were able to continue. Big Tree has now developed several young men um, under Pastor um, Andrew Jere, who had been teaching and preaching at other locations. Two church branches have started through them, along with two other Bible study or preaching points. And then there's two men named Simon and Peter. Not Simon Peter, but Simon and Peter, okay? And they've taken over for the last three months because the Jellowicks are actually in the States right now. Uh, they were here for, for the holidays, and they're getting some needed surgeries and different things. So uh, those two men have been, been handling that. And then Chikoka held its first three days men's conference where men came from as far away from five hours, okay, to do teaching and preaching. And he says that that was a big success. They also started a ministry called... Um, Joseph program, where they began to collect tithes and offerings and gifts in the form of maize. And he said, we collected over 6,000 pounds of maize, and it was just distributed to the widows, the orphans, and the needies in, the, in that area. Again, don't forget, they don't have, because everything's landlocked and borders are shut, they're not getting all the food and stuff that they need. And so they were able to collect over 6,000 pounds of maize to feed the widows and the orphans and the needy. And then the rest of it they sold just for cost to help uh, many others suffering uh, during this time too. Another, another family that a lot of us know well, they've been here fairly recently, Sean and Jerry Vance in Kenya, Africa. Um, if you know the story of Sean and Jerry, they went, um, I forget my years, but I think it was 2017, uh, they went over to Africa to begin to work with um, a veteran missionary named Randy Steerwald and his wife Phyllis. Um, they began to work with them, and they went for two years, and they, they, uh, they were trained under him, and then they came back uh, in 19, and they began deputation to help raise their support level. And so all was going well. 2020 began rather busy. He says they were in the midst of deputation. From January to March, God allowed us to present the ministry of Kenya to churches in Alabama, Missouri, Kansas, Colorado, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Ohio. And then, of course, also in January, uh, Sean was able to take a short trip to Kenya to meet with some of the leadership there um, because Randy at this point, Randy Steerwalt, the missionary, was back in the States. He had developed cancer. He was getting really pretty serious. Um, and so he returned, Sean, to, to Kenya to basically meet with the different pastors and leaders uh, to plan for the future because it looked like Randy would not be uh, returning. And then, of course, March hit and COVID happened. And it shut everything down. Until, and they were not able to go anywhere until July um, to do any, any travel anywhere except for one thing. Because in April, uh, missionary Randy Steerwald uh, went home to be with the Lord. They were able to travel here to Missouri um, where uh, Randy and Phyllis were living uh, for the burial. And, um, and so they were able to take part of that. And then because of the fact that Randy had passed and everything that was happening, he and his church, they made the decision that they would go back. And so they headed back to Kenya 
in August, okay, of, of this last year. After arriving in Kenya, okay, they moved into the house that Randy and Phyllis had had built in the 1950s, okay, so this was an old house. Those of you that have been to, to Zambia, you know, the mission station there, all of that stuff was built in the 80s, okay, and you know how hard and, and how much um, maintenance had to be done uh, there. Well, this house was built in the 50s, okay, and so they had to do some major renovations, um, new, new bathroom, paint the entire house, and they had a bat inf infestation in the attic, and so they had to deal with all that. He said we had, they also had to adjust to now being the lead missionary. They had gone from just being there helping the Steerwall family, and now all of a sudden they are the lead missionary. Um, he said it's our desire to see the ministry move forward the way God sees fit. We want to be obedient to the Holy Spirit's leading and know there are some changes that need to be made. But our focus is on the Bible Institutes, and so that is where they will be focusing a lot of, of things. Now, one thing they said when they got back, they had moments of being overwhelmed, okay? I mean, you know, they'd gone from just being missionaries there to being the lead missionary over this thriving work, and, and it was overwhelming at times. But he remembered the words that Randy would often say, that he repeated over and over. This work did not belong to him, to Randy. Sean saying, it does not belong to us, it belongs to God. He is the one responsible to see it continue. All we can do is stay close to him and lead the way that he wants. So he says, although it was a difficult year, we are amazed at how the Lord moved in our lives. During uncertainty, he proved himself faithful in our lives and provided just and proved just how much he loves us. Ever since being in Kenya, God has allowed us to partner with several churches that have taken us on for support, lessening the burden from the sending church. Even when they couldn't go see them, churches still began to take them on. And then one last thing with him. I don't know if you guys know his story, um, but one, he said one of the biggest highlights of 2020 was that God allowed me to find and meet my biological father. He said, I never knew him. He had no idea that I existed, and I never expected to know anything about him. But God knew exactly who and where he was, and we were able to meet before we left for Kenya. So that's just the little things in the midst of a pandemic and everything else that's going on in their lives, God gave him the chance to meet his, his biological father before, uh, before he went back. David and Carolina Godron in Bogota, Colombia. A lot of you guys, I know several people have been on trips over there. We took one with Good News in Action where we actually went and, and did evangelistic. And then for two years, we took teams over to do football, to do soccer uh, with David and, and foot for five, as they, as they call it. So um, he said lockdowns were strict in Bogota. So we had to respond with YouTube and Facebook live transmissions. The church responded very well to this effort. So we've seen the congregation stick together through all of this, through Facebook and YouTube. We've seen the Lord moving in a mighty way. We've been able as a church to help many of our members that have lost their job with food and groceries, and it's been a blessing to see the hand of our good Lord working in the lives of many. And that's what the church is there for, and that's exactly what they did. He said, we were very happy to see many families come to know Christ through this difficult time. Many of them are going through discipleship programs and growing in the Lord. We were able to have an in-person gathering the last Sunday of November. So guys, get, get in your minds, okay? You know, we were shut down from middle of March until May 31st, you know, two months roughly, okay? Here, us, this church, this local body. They didn't start meeting again until the last Sunday of November. Can you imagine how much that, that affects, you know, just your... I remember that first Sunday back, Teresa saying... I don't remember what you sang, but it was amazing, okay? Okay. Um, I remember it. I just don't remember it. What would you sing? I don't know either. Um, it was good. I mean, but just that, that feeling of being back and being around brothers and sisters. A lot of these churches in other parts of the world, guys, some of them, we'll see here in a minute, just uh, Manuel um, and Martha Estebene just got back last Sunday. It was their first Sunday meeting again. So, I mean, we are really blessed to, to, 
to what we've gone through. So it was a blessing, they said, to gather again after eight months of not being able to do so. We also saw 15 people getting baptized. So such a blessing in the things that are going on. Cody and Millie Walker in Argentina. Some of you may remember Cody, I think the last thing, well, we had him last fall on a Zoom call. But I think before that, he did a marriage conference here. I don't remember how many years ago that was. But so in February, he says, we finally found the area of Cordoba where the Lord wanted us to start a church. If you remember just in, in the things what he, where he told us, they didn't know exactly where they were going to end up, but they, the God pointed them to the right city. So he says, in February of 2020, we moved our family 125 miles east of the city of Cordoba. Now understand, that's where all of her family and everything was at. They were living with family. And so in February, they moved. God knew what was happening, okay? He knew in another month, you know, COVID was going to hit. Um, th that's where God had prepared a house with a separate building behind the house, which will hold the sanctuary in the future. And then in March, the pandemic hit. And Argentina would endure one of the longest quarantine restrictions in the world. He called it, he said, our quarantinity lasted till the last weeks of December, and the country still has a limited form of quarantine restrictions in certain areas that the virus has attacked uh, the most. He said the kids had been back to school for two weeks when it all happened. Um, the city where they landed is a city called uh, Balneria. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's how I'm pronouncing it. Um, before everything was shut down. Um, but he says, thank God his word was not suppressed. In July, the government allowed family gatherings, okay? And since the church is the family of God, we decided to have our family gatherings in our living room on Sunday mornings, and we have been holding services ever since. And then in August, they added a youth night on Wednesdays, and, and they've had an average of about 10 to 14 uh, kids coming to, to that. Um, during all the uncertainty, I think I'm one behind, aren't I? Yes, sorry guys. During all the uncertainty, he said, we've had countless opportunities to explain the gospel here in town. We've seen one salvation and started discipleship with six people, four of whom are ready for baptism. He says, pray for us this coming year. We have a building project in the building behind their house, and they have two evangelism campaigns. And that's, that's on my prayer that eventually we as a church will sponsor a trip to go to Argentina and work with uh, Cody and, and Millie. Um, one of the, the cool things, I just thought of this, again, our, our church doing different things. You know, I'll, he'll put out needs to me, and one of the needs that they had probably about a year ago is they had bought this car, and they had bald tires, okay? And they needed tires, and he needed... 400 bucks for tires, I don't know, however much it was. And this church was able, I almost threw that picture in there and I didn't because he sent me a picture of their tires on their car, okay? So just the little things that this church does, a lot of times it's to put a roof on a, on a church, but sometimes it's just something to help out a missionary that is in need. Okay, Joe and Amy Hendrigsman in Oaxaca, Mexico. I can't tell you, whoever cheered for me, you know how much I have struggled with this word, okay? I mean, look at the way that's spelled, O-A-X-A-C-A. -A -A. Does that look like Oaxaca? No, it doesn't, okay? <laughs> I missed, we do what? <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story. The reason I can't pronounce it, this word, it's the fault of Anali Paloma Herrera Hernandez, okay? It is her fault because when she moved in with us back in 2016, I don't know, we were at the dinner table and I probably burped or farted or something, and she was like, wakala. And I, so that was the first Spanish word that I learned under Paloma was wakala, and it sounds too much like uh, Oaxaca. See, I, I'm now totally messed up, okay? Sound too much the same, I, you know, Joe, poor, I mean, he, he worked with me and worked with me, and I finally, for the last week and a half, practiced how to say Oaxaca. Did, did I say it well? Okay, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> so he says, praise the Lord, the pandemic only slowed us down for about four months. 
We were ordered by the local government to suspend all church activities the end of March. We began to encourage the members by taking groceries to them, phone calls, texts, visits from a distance while we waited for permission to open. Slowly, we were permitted to, to open the church doors and limited attendance and with safety protocols in place. In June, we celebrated our third anniversary of Grace Baptist Church in Santa Maria with a fellowship lunch. So they, they have it. It's interesting how some places will have restrictions and some will not have restrictions. He says uh, since then they've been running full speed, Wednesday night Bible studies, different things like that. He says the church people are encouraged to cite setbacks. And then in July, that right picture, you see that they had a, a trailer load of 5,000 whole Bibles that was delivered to them. If you ever want to watch some really neat videos, uh, go on Facebook and friend Joe Hendrigsman, Joe or well, Joe Hendrigsman. Um, he does some of the neatest videos, okay? When they were starting their building process, he did a video, and one of the coolest things I'd ever seen, his dad had passed away, and he took his dad's Bible, and before they laid the foundation, poured the, the footers for the foundation of that church, he took his dad's Bible, and he put it down there, and they poured it into the concrete. And I'm watching that, and I'm just bawling, because I'm like, wow. I mean, the, the church built on the Word of God. So if you ever want to watch some just really cool videos, and this was one of them, the day they were unloading all these Bibles, you know, he's videoing, and you see all the church members with masks on and just out there getting the Bibles. They were able to give away all 5,000 Bibles in that first day to pastors that needed them. Um, there you can see the, the Bible distribution and what I was just talking about, the construction of the church building. All of that was able to just continue. And then the neatest thing is, is they had been having to do their, their residency permits and everything, and they'd have to come back every year for at least 30 days. And so they were able, he says, our paperwork was received and approved, and at the end of January, today's the last day, uh, we will receive our permanent residency card so they won't have to be making that, that trip back and forth across the border. So, so that, is, that is awesome news. Um, Talant Kretschy in Tirana, Albania. Probably not many of you guys know him. Um, he actually was in the... No, that was Cezanne. Um, I, I know Jay Crawley uh, has been to Albania, so he met him. He's a guy that we support there, him and his family. He basically took over Jeff Bartel's work when Jeff came back to the United States, um, probably, I don't know, 10, 15, 10 years ago. Um, so again, everything regular, January through March. On March, they had uh, Mother's Day, where they invited unsaved mothers and other peoples uh, for an evangelistic service. March 16th to May 20th, two full months of shutdown, quarantine. Um, May 5th, through the 8th, they were able to go back to the church building, limited, you know, all that kind of stuff like normal. So on November 8th, they started up two services. Uh, so it allowed them to be able to have more people in because the government was very strict on how many people they would have in there. It also allowed them to, to start inviting lost people. And then December the 20th, um, Christmas service, eight or more people proclaimed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. So we're seeing great things happen still in all those different parts of the world. David and Sarah Booth, uh, missionaries to Portugal, um, they were with us probably a couple of years ago, I can't remember exactly, um, on a Wednesday night, I think back in 2019, I think they were with us. And again, like normal, he said, things started out pretty good. They saw six people saved, five of whom, uh, or sorry, six people baptized, five of whom were teenagers. Early part of last year, he was able to take a, um, a group of four people on a mission trip to North Africa. Um, all that went well. They, they received 16 new church members. But then, of course, March hit. And their online presence, he says, has increased exponentially this year. Like people, hey, you adjust and you go with what you can do. Um, but he said, despite um, not having in-person services for three months this year, the church's giving ended up being almost 10% over what had been originally budgeted. We saw a real heart of generosity. So, so th that's a good sign, okay? When a, when a church is, may not have church for three months, but people still are mature enough 
in, in, their, in their walk with Christ to know I'm still, still giving to the church. He had four men that began seminary classes, and then the one discouraging thing, I don't know if you remember um, David and Sarah, but that one of their big ministries there is sign language for deaf people because they both can, can sign, and that has been the discouraging thing. It, it, it has um, the, the in, not having in-person interaction with the deaf has really hampered that ministry. So they've asked us to really pray for that and, and for those people. Fredgy John, TTI, which stands for Timothy Training Initiative. He is, is basically, he's in India, but he travels all over Asia. And they basically, what it is, is are training men to start churches, okay? And that's essentially what they do. So, of course, January, he said, you know, things started out really well. He was traveling all over. Uh, he was in um, uh, Malaysia. He was in Thailand. He was in Laos. Um, all over. He even, he even was in the States training some, or tape, taping some training videos in California. He was in Minnesota, North Carolina, Florida. And then March 12th, he returned to Malaysia, and as soon as he got there, the shutdown happened. And so, you know, he's been compensating, doing, doing Zoom calls and WhatsApp calls and just different ways that people have learned to communicate all over the world. He said, the one thing, the one thing is I had a great time with my family, maybe the longest uninterrupted time in the last 26 years of our marriage. My daughter had online classes during the second semester in her 11th grade, um, 12th grade, she went back to regular classes. And so the one good thing that came out of that is he said, because he travels a lot. And so he was able to be at home for a lot of, of that time. Of course, I think most of you guys know these folks, okay? Larry and Charlotte Franklin uh, with ICME. Um, as everyone, Larry said, shut down. He said, March happened, and basically all their meetings just got canceled. Um, a lot of what Larry and Charlotte do is they plan meetings where they go and they train Sunday school teachers. I mean, that's, as you, most of you probably know, that's what they do. And then even with that, the clean heart track. I mean, people weren't passing them out. People weren't going anywhere, so they weren't passing them out. But still, they got out about 15 tracks, 15, 15, sorry, 15,000 tracks, okay, last year. And already this year, they've had 8,000 get shipped to Doug Rogers in Mexico and 5000 to uh, Bill Barker in the Philippines. And he said already $800 has been giving for shipping and, and all that sort of thing. So continue to pray for Larry and Charlotte. They've had their, their share of health struggles over the year as well. So um, just be praying, praying for them if you would. Paul Clark in Bogota um, has a ministry called Columbia for Christ where they, they reach out to... Um, all of Colombia, okay? And I'll tell you guys, probably nobody in this room has probably met Paul Clark. I think the only one that's met him is myself and my brother. Well, wait a second. Side bottoms. Have you guys ever met him? Yeah? Okay. Sorry. Forgot. Old KCBT people may know um, um, Paul Clark as well. That was my very first mission trip in 1986, one year out of high school, uh, we had a mission trip to Bogota, Colombia, and that was the first place, and that was where God really touched my heart for missions was through Paul Clark and, and there in Bogota. So he said, 2020, you know, he said, even with everything that happened, they saw hundreds of people get saved, um, many get baptized. He said, 10 new works are sprouting up in Colombia, and then literally 16 countries around the world they're getting inroads to people that are hearing messages on YouTube in different ways online that they're going to be sending people out to begin churches in those different areas. Here's another face you guys are probably familiar with, Lee and Heather Carter. Of course, they were in our church a number of years ago, uh, went to Decatur, and then from Decatur, they have now gone to the Dominican Republic. Uh, they've been on, on deputation before 2020 for probably about a year or so. And amazing thing is they moved uh, to Dominican July in the midst of a pandemic. Um, only God would do something like that, okay? And so they moved in July, and within one week of arrival, the country went under a nationwide curfew 
that has been very restrictive. On the weekends, it consists of 17 hours in their home, okay? And the weekdays, 12 hours they have to be at home. So what they do, they began ministering immediately to those in their neighborhood. They led 12 people to Christ within the first two weeks and started a discipleship process with those, with those people. From July to December, okay, in that six months that they were there, they know of 178 salvations, 43 baptisms, nine, he said, in a new area, and discipleship started with 20, and in addition to that, Lee is teaching the local churches what discipleship is and how to do it, okay? So not just reaching people through evangelism, but he is discipling them as well. They also have a, have a ministry called Bags of Hope. This is an intersection ministry where we give the children, the children there, they'll come up to them if they're out on the streets. We'll come up to them and, and ask them for things. He says, so those that are asking, they give them a bag that has a bottle of water, a pack of cheese crackers, some candy, and a clean heart track, the, the track from Larry and Charlotte. Uh, he says, the fruit of this has been amazing. And then he also says, we are thankful for God's provision and care during Lee's surgery. So for those of you that don't know, probably about three and a half, four months ago, Lee was taking some sort of a, um, a, a drug that, an antibiotic, sorry, not a drug, an antibiotic uh, for a sinus infection, and it, it caused a problem with his tendon, and he basically, his tendon just balled up in his arm. He ended up having to have surgery, but they chose, instead of coming back to the United States for surgery, they chose to have it done in the Dominican Republic so they could be a testimony to the doctors that their God is greater than anything. And so he had surgery probably about two weeks ago, I think, something like that. He's doing well, continue to pray for that. They have a couple prayer requests that I'll just throw out real quick. Bethany's getting married um, February 12th. A lot to handle in a foreign field that is new to you, okay, planning a wedding. Uh, pray for Lee and Heather to continue to have supernatural wisdom and discernment, um, continued healing for Lee's arm, safety physically as they minister daily in, in the Dominican, and then <laughs> the last thing he said is pray for this curfew to stop, okay, because it is, like I said, very restrictive. Um, of course, here's a family that we're, we're all familiar with, Steve and, and Pam Kern. Steve has been here um, many, many times. He's a great friend of this church. He's been on the missionary, on the, the, the foreign field in El Salvador since 1986. I mean, that to me, that just blows my mind that he has been there. He went basically right after, uh, well, yeah, right after the Civil War that happened in El Salvador. Um, so when the pandemic began in March, he said, we made the decision to do three things. Mobilize our ministry, churches, and missions to concentrate on sharing the gospel with the lost. That's what they've always done, okay? So that's not going to change. Secondly, take care of our congregations physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And then maintain a sense of community even though we could not physically meet with each other. And so that's what they did, okay? Collective creativity was key. They had evangelistic outdoor campaigns in January and February. And then in August, they mobilized the church members to share the gospel digitally through a week-long campaign called Trivid 20. Over 200 members participated and have continued to share the gospel to the point that we have been able to reach thousands of people through their personal contacts. We also were able to reach over 3,000 people through our transmission of I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I don't do Spanish, where we focused on um, vital topics during the t pandemic. We also were able to share the gospel as we gave out food to needy families. Overall, through this difficult year of 2020, they had over 5,000 professions of faith. That just, that just blows my mind to, to think of what that church has done. They were able to reach out um, to, uh, to, to families and to people with food packages. Um, they met every Wednesday to encourage their church members. And then one of the greatest blessings through all this was they learned to, to, to do things digitally, virtually. And so that's what they've done. If you know much about that church, they have five different campuses around the city of San Salvador in El Salvador. And they are starting a sixth one this year and it is a virtual church because they've learned to do it so well and they've reached so many people. 
So it was a tough year. They're looking forward to 2021, starting the new work in Mexico City along with all the other uh, ministry works that continue to go on. Johannes Catani, Johannes and Kittis, um, they deal with the deaf in, um, in, right there in the capital in Lusaka. Well, actually, all over um, Zambia, but they are concentrated right there in Lusaka. Um, he talked about one lady in the church that passed away. They didn't have the ability to, the money to be able to, to transport her body. So he, he provided the money in a truck, and they had a church service. And in that church service, they had 35 precious souls give their life to the Lord. So, you know, it's just amazing how they continue to reach out to people. Nelson and Rosemary Rivas in uh, Guatemala, he said, like so many, they have had, um, you know, they couldn't meet. And so they finally just got together for the first time in January as well. And, and they couldn't meet inside. They meet in the parking lot of the, of the church building where they meet. Larry and Tammy Allred, um, missionaries to Merida, Mexico, they have had... Um, They've had good attendance online, virtually. They've been back and forth, um, shutdowns to no shutdowns, um, but they continue to go forward. Um, Gorin and Gina Huniak, Victory in Soccer. A lot of you know Gorin and Gina just because they do our soccer clinics um, up on our fields as well. He said, in the midst of a fear-gripped country over the virus, talking about ours, and death, where most people found themselves completely shut down from summer activities, God graciously allowed us to host two camps this summer, and they were able to see several kids come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. David Boro, um, working through TTI in India, he kind of works under Fredgy John. Um, David actually contracted uh, COVID back in October, if I remember correctly. God healed him. He's back to, uh, to doing the work of the ministry. I think you know these guys, um, Brian and Tammy, of course, our missionaries to, uh, to Zambia, Africa. Um, Pastor Elijah Pule has officially taken over. They're working on a neat project. They were able to plant castor oil seed, which will hopefully begin to, to produce crops, which will produce income to, to help support the ministry. Um, they're starting the institute back up. They're working on the side-by-side -side building that a lot of you have donated funds to. Hopefully that will open in June. And then the last thing I would tell you guys is to pray for Brian, Brian, Tammy, and Titus. But, you know, Brian just got back the day after the election, January the 21st, okay? He just got back from Zambia. And, you know, a lot of you out there have been on mission trips with me. You go for a week, you go for two weeks, you come back. And I always tell people, you're going to have this thing that's called reverse culture shock, okay? After a week or two, in a foreign country where you're seeing God working and all these things going on, imagine being in Zambia for four years and now you're coming back to the States, okay? So I would encourage you guys, pray for Brian, okay? Pray for Brian and Tammy and Titus as they go backwards to the United States. And then this is the, the last list. It's, it's kind of the other missionaries that I didn't have a current picture on, ones that I hadn't necessarily heard from specifically um, about an update. Um, so be, be praying for them. They're, all their names are out on our website. You can see them over here on the wall. Um, last thing I want to do, and I'll be quick because I'm already over time. I apologize, okay? I'm going to read real quickly. Um, Matthew chapter 18, sorry, 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Three quick points for you here out of that passage, okay? We, we, that, that passage there commands us to go, okay? There's three different ways that I see that we can go. We can go physically by going, okay? And this church, one of the things we do except for last year because it was 2020, we always provide at least one foreign mission trip where you can go and you can see the field. And this year is no difference. And on February 21st, we're going to be having an informational meeting after the second service right over there in the cafe. 
If you have any interest, this does not commit you to anything, but if you have any interest in going on a mission trip, I'll be presenting the two different fields. I'll tell you right now, they are going to be, and it's up there, to uh, in late July, San, San Padre uh, Honduras, and then in uh, the fall of, of this year, we will be going to Oaxaca, Mexico. I did it, okay? So that's that. We can also go by giving. And that's what we've talked about here today, okay? You can go to the mission field by giving to missionaries, okay? You, you know, this church does it corporately. You can do it individually to any missionary that you desire. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, it says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again to my necessity. Missionaries need our money. I mean, it's all there is to it, okay? God will provide, but he'll use you, to, you and I to provide it. And then the last thing we can do, as we've talked about already, is we can go by praying. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, brethren, pray for us. Why? That the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. We need to pray for our missionaries. Why? So that the word of God has free course and it can go forth. And then also we need to pray for them and for their safety. We meet every Sunday morning. We used to meet right over here at 8 o'clock. We now meet on Zoom at 745. If you ever want to join, send me a message. I will gladly send you the Zoom link. We meet at 745 so that if you want to come to first service, you can still get here in time for first service. But we pray very systematically and very specifically for the different needs of the needs of the missionaries that you have seen on the slides today. I apologize, I went a little bit long. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, I just want to thank you so much for this time, Lord. I know we've we've covered a lot of ground looking at the lives of so many different missionaries that this church has supported, a lot of them for many, many, many years, Lord God. We thank you for their lives and for their dedication, Lord, and it's all about you. That's why they, they're there. That's why they go, Lord, just to proclaim the name of Jesus as we sang about earlier today, Lord God. So God, I, I pray for this church, Lord. I pray that we will take it seriously, that, that everyone in this room will consider one of the foreign mission trips this, this year that we are going to get back to going. It's going to be different this year, Lord God, but we by faith are going to step out and we're going to go uh, to, to take the good news uh, to, the, to the people of Honduras and to the people of, of Mexico. Um, God, we can also pray by giving and we can also or go by giving and we can also give by praying. And we need to all be active in praying for our missionaries. Lord God, again, we thank you for this time. Pray that you'll dismiss us with your blessings. In your name we pray. Amen.